Welcome everyone to We're Still in the Outbreak Period, End of Year COVID-19 Benefits Compliance Considerations. Thank you all so much for joining us. Our moderator for today's call is Diane Cross. She will be answering the questions you send through the Q&A today. We will try our best to answer all of your questions, but if for whatever reason we are unable to get to your question today, please follow up with your advisor for further assistance. Today's presentation is being recorded. We will be sharing the recordings in the follow-up email. If there are any portions of this call that you missed, by Friday, you will receive an email with a link to the full recording. The PowerPoint slides used during this presentation will be shared in the same email. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's webinar. Joining us today are Jill Brooking, Vice President and Counsel, and Beth Allen, Vice President and Counsel for NFP's Benefits Compliance Department. We're very excited to have them speaking with us today. It is my pleasure to hand the call over to our speaker. Beth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Amber, and thank you everybody for joining us today for we're still in the outbreak break period, end of year COVID-19 benefits compliance considerations. Um, now I know that, you know, everyone on this call would like to see a day where we don't have to discuss uh, <laughs> guidance specific to COVID-19. Um, I would also like for that day to come and I will not speak for my colleagues, um, but we all know that, you know, this has been really a, a long and tedious process. Um, and our goal for today was really just to go through the different pieces of guidance that we received um, about COVID-19 uh, from the government and kind of make sure that you know what is still going, what's over, um, and where we are in the process of compliance. And so as Amber mentioned, today it's me and Jill Brooking. Jill, say hi. Hello. And we are going to be giving you some informational guidance. As always, we're not your legal advisor or tax counsel. And so you will want to, uh, you know, get any legal advice or tax advice that you need from one of those types of entities. So just to kind of loosen things up a, bit, a little bit and maybe to not do COVID for a second, we thought it would be cool to start off with a poll. And so... If you could just, you know, uh, oblige us and let us know what is your favorite pie for Thanksgiving. Amber, can you run that poll real quick? My answer would be all of them. All the pie. That is, that's interesting. Um, I'm definitely an apple girl. I like mm. apple pie, very classic. Um, key lime pie is not on here. And surprisingly, that has been my favorite as of late. But I don't know if key lime pie is a Thanksgiving thing. All right, Amber, uh, let's end out that poll and see what people said. Ooh, we have a, ooh, we have two write-in votes for sweet potato pie. That was a good write-in. That is also my favorite Thanksgiving pie is sweet potato um, sweet potatoes give you a twofer because you can make it for size and then you can also throw it into a pie oh, yeah. and it's fantastic. Lots of writing. You want to talk about the results here? Yeah. Pumpkin is the overall winner with 39%. 5% of our audience does not like pie. That's kind of interesting. It is interesting. Uh, now, I will say there was something that I saw where Reese's did a giant Reese's cup the size of a pie this year where you could cut it like a pie, but they sold out of they it as out. quick as they in hours they announced it's, it's, it. They yeah. sold out. You cannot get it. Um, I also will leave some room for those of you who are more on the cobblers because that's not a pie, but it's also delicious. I love the apple cobbler, the peach cobbler, cobbler period. Good. Oh, yes. We have write-ins for pumpkin cheesecake. I like that. So good. It sounds like everyone is dessert friendly and we all hope that next week will bring you your dessert dessert dreams. Um, I know I'm looking forward to it. So with that said, you know, we're going to jump into the less fun part of today's conversation. No, it's always fun. <laughs> yeah. We, OK. OK. Uh, so just to give you a brief agenda, we're going to go through and just talk about the different pieces of COVID-19 government guidance that you see listed here. We'll go through it in this order. Uh, mind you, we chose to leave out the retirement guidance. Um, and that's because we got the retirement guidance very early on in the pandemic. And it was pretty much all over by the end of 2020. Um, and so any of you who will have, let's say, allowed for participants to take a larger participant loan or stop their payments or potentially take a hardship uh, based on COVID-19, none of that's going on anymore. So we chose not to focus on that today. And so instead, uh, we're going to go through the things you see listed here. And for each subject, 
we're basically going to go through and give you a brief overview of what's required. And none of that is going to be, you know, new information, I think, for most of you. Um, you will have heard this from us a few times over the last almost two years. Um, but then we're also going to give you an idea of whether or not the requirement is over or ongoing, as well as some things to consider. And so, Jill, I'll kick it over to you to start off with tax credits for extended paid leave. Thanks. And you'll see that we have the same format for each section. So I'm going to start us off with FFCRA. And so the first slide is going to be a brief overview. And so April 1st, 2020 through December 31st, 2020, last year, employers with fewer than 500 employees were required to provide paid leave. And then this year, January 1st, 2021 through September 30th, 2021, employers with fewer than 500 employees had the option to provide leave. So you'll see a lot of that as we go through. Were you required to do it? Was it voluntary? Um, so um, this was both at different times. So last year required, this year optional. And you remember these were, this was the paid leave for all those reasons that had to do with COVID-19. Uh, at first it was just the person had COVID-19 or symptoms and they were seeking medical advice, or maybe they were taking care of someone with COVID or symptoms and, or they were awaiting tests. And then we got the vaccination and then there were vaccine, I mean, uh, quarantine orders. So all of that. So big question, is it over or is it ongoing? The answer is almost over. The leave period itself is over. So this was kind of a trick question. So because you saw on the previous slide that it said the even the optional period is over September 30th, 2021. Uh, that is over. But if you provided this leave this year during the optional period, you have until December 31st to claim the tax credit for leave provided in quarter three. So it's almost over. The leave itself is over. But if you provided that, the employer gets 100% tax credit for providing that. Are there anything else, other things you need to think about? Yes. Again, 2021 paid leave was optional for employers with fewer than 500 and unavailable to larger employers. There is no indication that this will be extended. We always get that question and it's a good question. I mean, you know, we see how Congress is working on bills and proposals uh, towards the end of the year, but at this point there um, doesn't look like there will be an extension for this. There was President Biden's administrative order and then the OSHA ETS, and I've tried really hard to spell out my acronyms in this session. So the ETS stands for Emergency Temporary Standard. And that would have required employers with 100 or more employees to provide paid leave for employees when they, um, to receive the vaccination or if they received the vaccination and then had side effects related to it. But um, as we'll talk about uh, a little bit more, that order has been put on hold for now, pending further judicial review. And so at this point, at this time, there is no federal requirement or option or tax credit to provide paid leave related to COVID. Some states still have required paid leave related to COVID-19. Uh, New York, D.C. comes to mind. I didn't want to list all of them here as this is more of just a quick discussion of things that you need to be doing towards year end. So I provided a resource for you here that um, gives you all the state related information on COVID-19 leaves. Um, it is all the COVID-19 state laws that have been passed. And then the highlighted ones with asterisks next to them are leave provisions. And you would look at the leave provisions for the states where your employees are located. And that's an NFP resource. And that's just on the public site. Okay, I think that's the last one for this section. Do we have any questions on FFCRA 
or are we all relieved for the relief to be over? <laughs> I think everybody is still thinking about pies right now. Um, <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> Apple all the way. Um, at any rate, uh, no questions at this point, but we'll chime in as they come in. Okay, great. Yeah, we I mean, did. this stuff is old hat by now. Yeah, we did get the, <laughs> the question we always get, which is, will you get these slides? You will get these slides. So that is going to happen. You can have these slides. Yes. All right. Okay, and we already have a DCAP question, and that's where I'm going next. Good segue to FSAs, DCAPs, and Section 125. Let me tell you, this is not a fun slide. It was not a fun slide to put together. It's not a fun slide to talk about. These are all optional. These were optional. Nothing was required on this slide. So pay attention, because there will be a poll question at the end of this slide. Section 125, Cafeteria Plan. I'd like to think about years from now when we are training people to come and work in our department or when you're training people to come work for you, we will not so finally refer back to the years 2020 and 2021 as the years that all the rules went out the window that I like to call it open season. They could do whatever they wanted. So if you would let employees in 2020 and in plan years ending in 2021, and that's another acronym for you, PY, it's not PYT, the Michael Jackson song, it is plan years, PY. So plan years ending in 2021 and 20, if you allowed them to, employees could make certain election changes without a qualifying event. And that goes against everything we've ever said. But you could let them do that. Then for dependent care assistance programs, DCAPs, as we call them, or dependent care FSA, that's the same thing. Um, they, too, could make election changes under DCAPs in 20 and 21 if you let them. And then for plan years, or grace periods ending in 2020, there was that um, special little extended claims period until December 31st, 2020, if you opted for it. Because remember, daycares were closed last year in uh, most of the summer, and most of the fall. And so when employees had elected their daycare expenses earlier in 2020, they had all those funds left over and so um, for plan years or grace periods ending in 2020, you could allow them to continue to incur the dependent care claims until December 31st, 2020. Um, also for calendar year 2021, this year, um, the IRS increased the income exclusion from 5,000 to 10,500. And the 5,000 is the same every single year on DCAP. That does not go up. 2,500 for um, married filing jointly. Um, so it was a big deal that it went up to 10,500 for 2021. That was for this calendar year only. Calendar year, not plan year. Plan years ending in 2020 and 2021 the dependent care could have a carryover. They normally don't have that. That was special only for 2020 and 2021. Again, you, it was optional. You could allow employees to carry over any remaining DCAP funds from 2020 into 2021 or 2021 into 2022. Plan years ending in 2020 and 2021 you can, if you want, have a grace period up to 12 months. Usually it's two and a half months. But again, if you want them to, you can have um, employees that uh, can have an extended grace period. You would do it for the whole plan, not certain employees, for up to 12 months. And then for last year, 2020 plan years, there was that reimbursement for aged out dependents. Again, that was to help employees spend down money that they may have already um, elected. So that is a good little bulleted list of what changes 
could be made with a DCAP, the options for an employer, you could have said, I'm not doing any of them. And it is what it is. That was your choice. So now let's talk about health flexible spending accounts, health FSAs, as they are known. So much of the same with a little bit of a difference. So plan years ending in 2020 and 2021, employees can make those changes again without a qualifying event. Some of you call that a QLE, qualifying life event, QE, qualifying event, same thing. Um, plan years or grace periods ending in 2020. Last year, they had that same claims uh, extended period until December 31st, if you let them last year. And then plan years ending last year or this year, they can co carry over any amount on the health FSA. That's usually limited to 500, 550, it's indexed now. But um, for last year and this year, you can let them carry over any health FSA amount if you allow it. Plan years ending in 2020 and 2021, last year and this year, that same 12 month extended grace period, and then um, for calendar year 2020 and 2021, post-termination reimbursement. This is different. You usually have this on a dependent care anytime, but this was an add-on for health FSAs just last year and this year. So after I terminate employment, let's say I have some money left in my health FSA account, a balance. Normally, the only way I can access that is if I elect COBRA. Well, for this year and last year, there was this spend down provision for health FSAs um, where I could spend down that money after my termination date, even if I did not elect COBRA. I didn't, um, I didn't necessarily get to... Um, go through all the normal things of COBRA, pay the premiums, which there's a thing on right now, but I could continue to incur to get the money that was left in the account and I didn't have to pay for that. I didn't have to pay a premium like I normally, normally would on COBRA. I don't know of any client that did that, the spend down post-termination reimbursements for health FSAs, but with that in mind, we're going to roll out a poll right now, I would like to know which of these provisions did your company adopt, if any, and I will explain them again as you go through them. The first one, did you allow employees to change elections mid-year without a qualifying event last year or this year? Did you extend the grace period beyond the normal two and a half months for a health FSA? And again, last year or this year, did you allow an extended grace period, which is additional time for them to incur claims? That's what a grace period is. Did you allow a carryover of any amount? under the health FSA? Did you say, hey, you had $700 left last year or this year and you're letting them carry over any amount in the health FSA? Did you add a carryover to the DCAP? Usually there is no carryover for the DCAP. Did you add that last year or this year? Did you allow employees to contribute more than $5,000 to the DCAP in 2021? Did you allow them to increase? So answer the poll. And then, um, yes, carryovers are optional for health FSAs. You can have a grace period or a carryover for a health FSA or neither. So, or saying none. And then if you'll answer the poll, so I'll give you just a second to think about that and I'll be quiet. Okay, and you can answer, choose all that apply. I should have added, choose all that apply if you did any of those. Okay, I'm really interested in seeing this answer and I should tell you that your answer determines how I do the next two slides. Choose your own adventure. Okay, Amber, let's see what these results are. Ooh, 
Ooh, it's kind of all over the map. That is very interesting. Um, a good solid 50% of our audience today um, said none. Um, they didn't do any of these things. So um, that's kind of what we were expecting that half didn't do anything. But the other options really surprised me. I expected um, the remaining ones to say that they had allowed employees to make changes mid-year without a qualifying event. Only 28% of the audience said that they had allowed those mid-year elections mm -hmm. without a qualifying event. Then 19% extended the grace period beyond the normal two and a half months for health FSA. Um, they allowed a carryover of any amount, so more than the 550, 27%, almost a third. Wow, that is surprising. And then added a carryover to the DCAP, 14%, and allowed employees to contribute more than 5,000 to the DCAP in 2021, 11%. And this goes to show you the good communication of our consultants and of our um, health FSA and DCAP vendors, TPAs. Um, everyone really tried to get the word out there on the options. So I'm really glad to see that, you know, some of you took advantage of that. It was definitely employer friendly. Employees liked that. Um, employees wanted to have options and be flexible with their money. So good for you. That's great. Okay. So the next slide is, and you've probably already figured it out. Is it ongoing or over? It's almost over. So all of these provisions, most of them, I should say, will be unavailable after December 31st, 2021. And I don't know about you, but on this one, I am so glad. I am, these are so confusing. Every time I have to answer a question, I have to go back to our reference material and be like, was this calendar year 2021? Was this for plan year ending in 2021? Is it, is it for DCAP, FSA? It's very confusing, but I want to point out it's almost over. Um, you could still have an extended grace period for up to 12 months on a health FSA or DCAP that goes into 2022. And then also you could have the um, DCAP carryover into 2022 or the more than normal carryover that goes into 2022 for the health FSA. So that part is um, not over. And I'll go into the next slide on what that means. But most importantly, it's not over because you still have to update your Section 125 cafeteria plan documents. For those of you that might be saying, what's a cafeteria plan document? That's another webinar, but I will say it's not your wrap document and it's not your carrier document. It is a separate document that had to be adopted at the inception of the plan and it needs to be amended when you take when you make any changes. If you don't have one, then you would want to check with your health FSA or DCAP provider. They likely will have one for you. OK, going on to the next one. What are the considerations? Um, if you made any of those, if you took advantage of any of the relief in 2020, you have to revise your cafeteria plan document by the end of this year coming up. And then if you adopted any of the relief for 2021, then you'd have until the end of next year to do this. So yes, we will be reminding you next year of the amendments. Again, there's no indication that these unruly provisions will be extended. Get, get what I did there, unruly. Um, if an employer permitted employees to elect more than $5,000 in DCAP, so I think that was like 17 or 14 percent of you um, allowed your employees to elect more than 5,000 this year for DCAP. It's going to be crucial for you to conduct that non-discrimination testing prior to end year um, because that's a common test to fail. I do want to point out. So let's say they roll over a DCAP amount to 2022. What does that do to that? income limit because they're only allowed to do an income limit of $5,000 in 2022 for 2021. It went up. That was the only year. Well, the IRS helped us out. 
they did provide relief that if the amount over 5,000 is due to an amount that rolled over from 2021, or if it is because of an extended grace period from contributions in 2021, that the participant will not receive taxation on that excess amount over $5,000. And the resource that I say is very helpful, and I can say that without patting myself on the back because I did not do it. Our moderator, Diane, did it. Optional versus mandatory chart, an NFP resource on the public site. This has a box on a chart for every single one of these things I talked about, what you have to do, which plans it applies to, if it's optional or if it's mandatory. I saw some questions come in, Diane, on this, but I tried to answer them as they came in. Do you yes, feel and you that? Did have, oh, go ahead. Do you feel that any were outstanding? Well, I think it might be good to reiterate how a rollover or a um, carryover, depending on the terminology used, or grace period might impact HSA eligibility. Ooh. For yeah. So, for example, if somebody might pick to enroll in an HSA for the 2022 plan year, for the 2021 plan year, they were enrolled in a general purpose health FSA. So we did get that one. And I thought that might be good to discuss. That is a really good question. Um, I'm glad they asked it. I should have added that to things to consider. But yeah, so if you, and this is anytime you have a health FSA rollover, because remember this, the, the provision to have a rollover or carryover is an existing provision. That's not new. But the amount that they could roll over, that was the relief. They were allowed to roll over more than the normal amount. So anytime that you have a health FSA rollover, you have to consider HSA eligibility. And it does not matter. Um, pending claims, anything like that, you have to go by at the end of the plan year, on the very end of the health FSA plan year, does the participant have a cash balance? That includes claims that have not yet been processed, submitted but not processed. If they have a cash balance remaining at the end of the health FSA year and the plan has a um, carryover or a grace period, then that person will not, that employee will not be eligible for HSA contributions until the end of that coverage period. So if it's a grace period, two and a half months, they will be eligible the first day of the month following the grace period. If it's a carryover, then they will not be eligible for that entire year because they have a cash balance. Now, one of the options, solutions, I should say, is that you could have a plan design that any carryover amounts from a health FSA are carried over to a limited purpose or um, HSA compatible health FSA. Any comments you want to add, Beth or Diane? I think that's good. Um, just looking at time. Um, I will also mention that, you know, make sure that you understand kind of what that dichotomy looks like with FSAs, HSAs, and what's a qualifying event, right? Because if they do potentially, um, you know, have a cash balance, as you mentioned, um, that won't necessarily stop them from getting in the high deductible health plan, but they can't participate in the HSA beforehand, yes. right? So let's say that the person chooses the PPO because they have a balance left in their FSA. It's not a qualifying event in that three months when they've, you know, when the uh, grace period is over for them to switch from, let's say, a PPO to a high deductible health plan just because they've exhausted their FSA. Agreed. Okay, I'm going to be speeding it up now. No worries. We're about to, about to go fast. COBRA premium subsidies, what are they? Well... They were only available from April 1st through September of this year, and they were only for certain employees, spouses, and dependents. It was mandatory, mandatory, all caps, um, for employers subject to federal COBRA. 
and state continuation, though the administration was different under state continuation. It applied to those employees who lost coverage because of an involuntary termination or reduction of hours. Um, there was also that weird little second chance election, first time ever in my career um, that that happened, that um, they were allowed to elect coverage um, who were subsidy eligible, who they had previously waived or previously terminated coverage, and they were allowed to have a gap in coverage. That was just wild. Okay, is this over or continuing? <gasps> It's almost over. I know every single one of mine were like that. COBRA premium subsidies ended September 30th. But just like FFCRA, if you provided this, you can get 100% tax credit and you have until December 31st to claim that tax credit for subsidies provided in Q3. What are the considerations? Same things that we've been saying. No indication that this relief will be extended. It's over. And COBRA participants, if they want to continue coverage after September 30th, they'll either have to pay 102% of cost unless you otherwise subsidize them as the plan sponsor. Um, there is a temporary suspension of COBRA payment deadlines. Beth is going to talk about this. It did not extend their maximum coverage period. They either are limited to 18, 29 months, or 36 months. That's it. And then keep your records um, because this will be a big win that we expect DOL enforcement on. So um, all of your paperwork as normal, retain that. The end. Thank you. Jill, any questions about the COBRA premium assistance, Diane? No, just reiterating what Jill just said and that we we don't think that there'll be any subsidies coming back, but we don't know for sure. And as of right now, there's been no guidance. Thank you. So we are going to switch gears, um, kind of continuing on with some of the guidance that we got. Um, and one of the big things we got out of COVID-19 relief was uh, relief as it pertains to telehealth or telemedicine. Okay, so specific, specifically, the CARES Act and guidance that we got later basically provided some additional flexibility to offer telehealth services to participants. Um, the idea was that, you know, we all spent a year plus not necessarily wanting people to flood into doctor's offices in person um, to keep the virus from spreading. Uh, and so as part of this, the, the government came out and said, okay, we are going to allow for telehealth to be offered uh, potentially even without cost sharing, without that affecting the status of a high deductible health plan um, or people's HSA eligibility. Um, to go back on that, remember that the concept is that if you have a high deductible health plan, then the plan cannot pay out until the statutory deductible is met. Um, and if it does, then the people who participate in that plan would not be HSA eligible. And so the guidance that was given here by the government made it to where the, if there was telehealth coverage that was offered without cost sharing that would not stop the plan from being basically a qualified health, high deductible health plan and also would not make those participants ineligible for an HSA. Um, this was obviously welcomed by pretty much everyone. Um, I think people love this particular type of relief. Um, we also saw kind of slightly related, I guess, relief in that if there were employers who wanted to, let's say, offer a standalone telehealth benefits to employees who didn't actually have group health coverage, that they could do that without actually violating the ACA's market reforms. Um, the reason why this was necessary is because normally if you offer any type of group health plan or basically employer-sponsored health and welfare benefit that provides medical care, then that coverage has to comply with the ACA and a myriad of other laws. And so them coming out saying this allow for some large employers to basically offer those employees who did not have any other health coverage the opportunity to at least receive telehealth benefits. Um, and so this is the relief that we saw coming through um, from the government on telehealth. Now, is this over or ongoing? In true kind of continuing with the pattern, this is almost over. OK, and I say almost because that telehealth provision that was related to the high deductible health plan and HSA coverage um, was always made to be temporary. 
Okay, so it's going to be available for plan years that begin on or before December 31st, 2021. And so what that means for a lot of you who have, let's say, a calendar year plan is that as of January 1st, 2022, this particular relief is not currently going to be available. Okay, and then for those of you who have non calendar year plans that started sometime in 2021 um, after, let's say, January 1st then that relief is going to continue until the end of the plan year that started in 2021. And so that's going to be mid-year sometime, 2022, that this guidance will con continue. Now, although this, I think this was very popular, um, we're not aware of any legislative or regulatory opportunity to change it so or to extend it. Um, so we're not quite sure if this is going to continue, but employers are going to have to, for now, act like this is going to end. Um, Similarly, the telehealth relief that I talked about for the standalone tele telehealth benefit is effective for the rest of the plan year in which the COVID-19 public health emergency ends. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in, with some of the coming relief. Um, but newsflash, like the public health emergency has not ended. Um, and it doesn't necessarily look like it is going to end in the next month or two. Um, but keep in mind that this particular guidance for the standalone telehealth relief is going to continue as long as we have a public health emergency. Now, some things to consider. We thought this one was really interesting um, because it kind of did a few things for us. Obviously, it gave us the high deductible health plan and HSA relief that we needed, um, and that allowed people to have telehealth visits and even encourage telehealth visits. Um, so obviously kind of putting less people at risk of, of contracting COVID. Um, but interestingly, before this, we had not had the DOL or the IRS really opine a lot on whether or not telehealth um, you know, could make you lose your HSA or HDHP eligibility, right? And we even had a number of vendors who might have made the claim that, you know, the way that their telehealth was designed made it to where it didn't necessarily have to be ERISA compliant or it could still be HSA eligible, even though it paid on first dollar coverage. Um, but I think that this guidance from the IRS and DOL it makes it abundantly clear that telehealth is considered group health plan coverage because if it wasn't, they wouldn't have had to give this relief, right? And so I think that's kind of an important distinction to make going forward in the future, knowing that some of these kind of, you know, standalone wellness benefits or just carve out programs that also provide medical care are going to be subject to laws as if they are group health plan coverage. Another thing I'll point out is that a lot of states are implementing telehealth insurance mandates. Um, and so that's either requiring uh, you know, the insurers to cover telehealth at the same rate that they cover um, in-person care. But I think we're going to continue to see kind of um, this use of telehealth. Um, obviously, it was super popular during the pandemic, and I don't think that that is going to slow down. Um, I think that also, you know, leads to the fact that hopefully that there's a, enough support for this telehealth relief that we might actually see it be um, extended. And so, you know, although we don't expect it to come out of, for example, the Build Back Better plan or whatever it's called, um, <laughs> it could potentially just show up in there. OK, uh, we don't have any reason to know that it is, but I would not be shocked if it did come up. So, Diane, were there any questions on telehealth relief? You explained it beautifully. I think we're set for now. Thank you. So we're going to move on to, I think, one of the harder aspects <laughs> of the guidance that we got from the DOL and maybe uh, the aspect that maybe employers and service providers struggle with the most. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the extension of certain time frames. And so if you look back to May of 2020, the agencies basically required plans. And I put I should have like uppercase required there um, in that it was not a choice to disregard the period that was from March 1st, 2020 until 60 days following the national emergency, okay? Um, and so that whole period was known as the outbreak period. And what it meant was that the deadlines that would normally be imposed under certain laws were going to be told or stopped, okay? So it was like that time never occurred when it came to counting days uh, for the deadline. And so specifically, that had to do with deadlines under COBRA, HIPAA special enrollment rights, ERISA claims filing and appeals and external review, okay? Um, I could go through and give you the long litany of lists, but I think that, you know, the biggest thing here that I'm going to talk about specifically in the coming slides is the 30-day usually uh, deadline for HIPAA stairs that was obviously going to be extended, as well as pretty much all of the COBRA deadlines to elect it, to pay for it, um, to do any of those for COBRA were extended. And then we actually kind of, you know, when this first started, we didn't know how long it was going to particularly last. Um, the, the particular method, method that the 
agencies use to be able to extend these deadlines. Um, that particular method had kind of a one year limit. And so later on, the DOL put out a notice that clarified that that one year relief um, actually is based on an individual basis of when the relief is needed. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more just to kind of make it clear. Um, I think that all kind of that threw us all kind of for a loop because I think a lot of us thought that, well, this particular guidance was just going to end by February of 2021 and it is not. And so that kind of gives you a clue into whether or not this is over or ongoing. And it is ongoing. What? Okay? I know, you know. Not um, almost over. No, it is not almost over or over. Um, the outbreak period is still going, you know. And I point that out because when we talk about the outbreak period, it's not just a matter of when the national emergency over is over. It's 60 days after that, okay. Um, so we, you know, even when the national emergency is potentially over, it's 60 days after that. And the fact that it's kind of individual by individual um, basis means that it's going to be, you know, an issue that I think can come up for employers at any time. All right. So when we consider the considerations on that, like I mentioned, the relief is mandatory. This was not an option. Right. And with the HIPAA SARES, I think we ran into a lot of issues on this one. Um, because I think that maybe employer plan sponsors and even sometimes insurers confuse mm -hmm. this HIPAA-SER mandatory guidance with the optional guidance that Jill talked about earlier pertaining to the mid-year change under the qualifying event rules, right? And so remember that anytime there you have, you're talking about qualifying events and the opportunity to change mid-year, HIPAA-SERs are going to be required, right? So that is your birth, marriage, adoption, losing other coverage, losing Medicaid um, or CHIP, okay? And those are not an option for employers to recognize. Whereas there were other qualifying events like change in status and change in coverage under another employer's plan or uh, changes needed for FMLA that are permissible, meaning that the employer can choose to recognize them, right? Um, and so this particular guidance was specifically for HIPAA special enrollment rights. Um, but if someone had a HIPAA special enrollment right, the employer had to recognize it and had to toll the time um, for at least a year. So what that means as an example is if, that if you had someone or an employee who had a baby um, back in, let's say, um, February of this year, that person could come to you today in November and ask to enroll their baby. And you would have to let them. It is not a choice. It is not whether or not the insurer allows it you would have to enroll that baby. And we found that a lot of employers aren't quite aware that this is still going on. Um, and so keep in mind that this continues and you're gonna wanna recognize those HIPAA SARES um, for until at least the end of the outbreak period. Now, again, you're gonna distinguish between HIPAA SARES and permissible qualifying events. Um, and one way that you definitely know is distinguished is that if they're asking, coming to you asking you to drop coverage, Potentially, that is not going to be allowed under this particular guidance because HIPAA SARES generally allow you to enroll in coverage. Um, now, there are a couple ways there where you could potentially have someone who, let's say, you know, recognizes that HIPAA SARES late, um, but then they, let's say, they choose to get onto their employer's plan um, and their employer's or their spouse potentially comes with them, you know, then there might be some um, enrollment rights that they might have just based on the fact of like who lost coverage and when. Um, but keep in mind the difference between HIPAA SARES and permissible qualifying events. I think that ongoing COBRA obligations um, also, you know, are, are things that we're still running into. Um, mind you, you know, I think most COBRA vendors know that people have an, an open-ended kind of, not open-ended, at least a year amount of time to elect COBRA. Um, I think what we've seen from a practical standpoint is the vendors have kind of relied on employers to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do here. Um, as an example of this, you know, in giving out open enrollment materials, um, a lot of employers did not think about those people who are still in that year of time where they could come back and elect COBRA to provide those people open enrollment guides. And for the employers who kind of asked about this and potentially went to the vendor, the vendor's response was basically, you know, if you want us to do that, to send these people open enrollment guides, we will, but they weren't doing it otherwise. Okay, so keep in mind those ongoing COBRA obligations um, that are really just continuous. And even after the COBRA premium sub subsidies have ended, there are still going to be people who are entitled to come back and elect COBRA if they never did so in the last year. And then finally, um, a risk claims extension and FSA runout periods. 
Um, that's another thing where, you know, you have more time to come and basically say, hey, I had claims last year, um, you know, or up to a year ago, even depending on where, you know, the plan year is, that they are going to potentially have that additional time to to basically turn in their claims or receipts for coverage that was provided during the plan year in question. And so this extension of certain time frames, the biggest thing that I just want to impress on your head is that like, this is mandatory, okay? I got the question, thank you, Tina, and I love this, um, that, you know, that past premium, would that have to be paid? And I assume that she's talking about the HIPAA SARE, mm -hmm. but she could also be talking about COBRA. Um, with the HIPAA SARE, I, I'm glad you bring that up because we get a lot of people who are like, well, if you had that baby six months ago and you come and you tell us you want to enroll that baby, um, do they have to go back and back pay? They can actually elect it prospectively, right? Now, if they do want it retroactively, you can't actually retroactive um, the coverage based on birth. You can't do it based on marriage. So they wouldn't even have the option to retroactive. Um, but chances are most people in that predicament are going to want to do it forward and are going to pay you going forward. So you can be like, well, you can you can exercise this, but we're going to charge you going back eight months because they don't they don't have to do that. <laughs> like they don't have to do that. They can just do it prospectively. Um, with COBRA, COBRA is different because COBRA, you can actually go back um, and charge them from the co for the COBRA from when they first exercised basically that, that right or when they could have elected the COBRA. Um, but that's a different scenario as well. So thank you for those questions. And Diane, I just threw out the questions myself, so I'm going to go on to COVID-19 <laughs> testing. <laughs> and I know I'm going to get feedback that I moved really fast, so forgive me. All right. so. The next thing to consider um, is COVID-19 testing. And just with a brief overview of this, both the FFCRA and the CARES Act require that COVID-19 testing be provided by group health plans without cost sharing, okay? Um, guidance that came out later kind of clarified that this has to be for surveillance or, em or employment or excuse me that this has to actually be for diagnostic purposes and if the COVID-19 testing is for surveillance or employment purposes it's not required to be covered without cost sharing. I put a little um, star here asterisk here because although there was clear guidance that like you know if it was coverage for testing or for excuse me for employment reasons um, that it didn't have to be covered without cost sharing I don't know that insurers were able to really figure out when someone was receiving testing for diagnostic purposes versus when they were receiving uh, testing for employment purposes or surveillance purposes. And so, you know, although the guidance made it clear that you could have someone pay for the coverage for reasons that were outside of just regular diagnostic reasons, I don't know that, you know, the powers that be were able to basically figure out or distinguish between when that happened um, or how that happened. Um, and so, you know, it, it's kind of interesting, you know, and definitely I think we see a comment from someone that, that knows that their labs were doing surveillance testing and were actually filing the claims as diagnostic. I'm sure that there was a whole lot of that going on. Um, but I think that, you know, it was very clear that everyone wanted COVID-19 testing to be covered so that people would get it um, and hopefully not spread the virus. I'll also point out that many states, you know, also mandated COVID-19 testing be provided without cost sharing. Um, some even actually took it a step further and required COVID-19 treatment to be provided without cost sharing. And so I do think that this is something that, you know, was done, you know, pretty by and large across the country. And obviously, this is ongoing. People are still testing for COVID. Um, and this is still something that is supposed to be um, in place through the end of the national or public emergency. And as I mentioned, as when I discussed the extension of certain time frames, that's not over. So we're still in a place where group health plans should be covering COVID-19 testing without cost sharing. Um, obviously, this has been going on for months, as I mentioned. Um, obviously, you know, we've had the whole discussion of the fact that COVID-19 tests for diagnostic purposes should still be provided without cost sharing. Um, I think with kind of vaccine mandates on the horizon, um, I'm not sure what that's going to mean for the testing relief, right? Um, and whether or not they will potentially end the testing relief in favor of hoping that people are going to get vaccinated. Um, we'll have to kind of follow what happens with that. Um, but for now, that is set to keep going through the end of the, per the public uh, emergency. So we waited until the end for a subject that I think is really kind of outside. And Diane, let me stop. Did I have any questions on COVID-19 testing? 
We have one that just came in, which you might get to, to confirm if an employer requires vaccination and or testing or masking, if um, who bears the cost, the employer Thank or you. the employee. Thank you. And that is a fantastic question. And, and I will hold that off for a second and talk about it with this next guidance. So thank you for that. Um, the last piece of guidance or pieces of guidance that we're going to discuss here have to do with the COVID-19 um, vaccine guidance that we received. And there's really kind of a little bit of different guidance here. Um, specifically, the EEOC pretty early on in the pandemic put out guidance, you know, about what you needed to know from the standpoint of the Americans with Disabilities Act and kind of what those rules meant <clears throat> as it pertains to COVID-19, COVID-19 testing, as well as vaccines um, and vaccine mandates. And I include this um, link as, as often as I can, just because I think they do a good job of just going through and answering almost every question that you might have about vaccine mandates and what it means um, for the ADA. And so the bottom line there really is just that vaccine mandates can be done, right? Those were, that was a case before COVID-19, right? There were a lot of employers who actually mandated flu shots or other types of vaccine. And that can be done um, with the understanding that employers who do that are going to have to provide reasonable accommodations for employees who have a medical reason that they cannot take the vaccine or have a sincerely held religious belief um, that prevents them from taking the vaccine. Uh, so keep in mind, you know, that again, this, this uh, resource provides a lot of information about kind of what it means to, you know, be do a reasonable accommodation for one of those reasons, um, and also gives employers, you know, information about kind of what they can do, what they cannot do in regards to COVID-19 and vaccine mandates. And then also, you know, the ADA guidance does take it a step further to say that employers can potentially provide incentives for employees to take the vaccine. Um, keep in mind, though, that that kind of those incentives are going to be subject to other laws as well. And I'll talk about here briefly. Now, I should have said on the front of this conversation about COVID-19 vaccines that, again, a lot of this goes squarely into employment law. You know, and so we have provided kind of some guidance where we can um, and additional information. But these subjects are really things that employers should be discussing with legal counsel, specifically employment law counsel, that is familiar with these types of issues, um, because we really are getting into the arena of legal advice um, that employers, you know, where, where employers will want to have good counsel that they can rely on. Now, as far as vaccine premium surcharges or incentives, and so basically employers who might say, okay, if you're on our health plan, um, if you are not vaccinated, you have to pay additional premiums or you pay less premiums if you are vaccinated. Um, all of that is considered the same. And the DOL, HHS, and the Treasury came out with some guidance on that. Um, basically, all they did there was really confirm that where employers connect a vaccine mandate to their group health plan, they have to meet HIPAA's wellness rules for a health contingent activity only wellness program. And we have been shouting this from the rooftops um, since the vaccine first came out. Um, and so there are several resources that you can find from NFP and our team that talk about this, okay? Now, obviously this is an ongoing discussion. Um, obviously the rules here are gonna apply as long as an employer imposes vaccine requirements or incentives. And then also, you know, Biden's vaccine mandate for large employers through the OSHA ETS that Jill talked about early on, um, will likely impact how employers view the mandates and even the surcharges. As Jill mentioned, you know, there are some legal challenges there. Um, specifically, the ETS we're talking about required employers with over 100 employees to basically mandate vaccines or weekly COVID-19 testing and masks for employees who are not vaccinated um, if they work in the office. Now, mind you, the deadlines for this were actually kind of coming quickly. Um, by December 5th, employers had to design their policy and communicate it to employees. And by January 4th, 2022, the employees needed to be either be vaccinated or undergoing weekly testing. Now, mind you, again, legal advice is going to be important here, especially since we saw immediate legal challenges and currently the ETS is suspended um, because of, you know, legal challenges that we've seen across the country. And just yesterday, we got some movement on that um, because although the case had been um, kind of somewhat decided at this stage by the Fifth Circuit, who basically suspended the entire rule, um, the circuits basically consolidated all the cases that had been filed and the Sixth Circuit won the lottery, I guess, 
to hear these cases. Um, and so we don't quite know what the Sixth Circuit is going to do with the suspension that the Fifth Circuit put in place. Keep in mind that we're going to have a webinar um, by Employment Law Council in early December. Um, well, they're, where they're going to go into that ETS quite a bit more than I am going through it here. OK, so you will want to look out for that and make it for that. Now, mind you, vaccine guidance, just really quickly and things to consider. You know, employers really should assess their specific circumstances when they're deciding on what, it, whether it's a vaccine mandate or a vaccine surcharge. They really should consider kind of what their employees look like, you know, at least starting off with maybe a survey of which of your employees um, are already vaccinated. You know, if you want to come out and put this, do this super punitive, you know, vaccine surcharge, that may not actually yield you the results you need if a lot of people are already vaccinated. Um, and so consider kind of what is going on with your particular employer employee group. <coughs> Again, work with employment counsel, hopefully employment law counsel on that. And then also keep in mind that mid-year changes to your vaccine strategy really can result in kind of some things going wrong in your plan. You know, so in a prior presentation, we talked about the fact that, you know, if you do a surcharge or an incentive related to your health plan, that is going to factor in your affordability um, uh, calculation for the employer mandate, um, changing the cost of the coverage through this vaccine surcharge uh, will likely require you to offer, let's say, a qualifying event if your plan offers that permissible qualifying event. And so there are going to be certain things that if you try to do it mid-year could cause other problems elsewhere, and you want to be mindful of that. Now, I think the question that we got before I came to this subject had to do with whether or not employers could charge um, for the cost of like the testing um, and the masks and, and, and whatever people had to do if they were not vaccinated. Uh, the OSHA ETS does leave it open that employers could potentially make employees pay for their own COVID-19 testing. But then it also included the caveat um, that employers would have to basically comply with any other laws that might apply. And I know for a fact that we have state laws that indicate that the employer should actually pay for testing if it's mandatory testing. Um, and so that's a situation where if you're talking about having your employees pay for that mandatory testing, or even a mandatory mask. Um, there's questions on the mask as to whether or not a mandatory mask would be considered kind of like a mandatory uniform, um, in which case in some, in some states, the employer does have to undertake that cost. And so I say all that to say that, again, that's, that's also why you're gonna consult with legal counsel because they're gonna be able to take um, you know, your facts and circumstances into account in addition to the federal framework and the state framework in the state where you are to let you know what you can do. Diane, any questions about, I know we have like a minute left, so any questions about uh, COVID-19 vaccine guidance? You know, I think you covered everything for the sake of time. The okay. only outstanding question was clarification on with the stay um, with ETS guidance on whether that December 5th date is still applicable. Right. And I, right. And I so think that'll be. Thank you. Uh, so so OSHA did put out a statement yesterday that until things are kind of settled in the court, um, that they will not be implementing or enforcing the OSHA ETS. OK, um, and so for right now, that means that you'd have to assume that if we don't actually get a court um, decision, either setting aside the Fifth Circuit injunction um, or this going up to the Supreme Court, who then also potentially um, decides the other way that this is going to be on hold at least through December 5th. Um, and so, you know, there's a very large chance that this is not actually going to go into play by the time that first deadline comes in, but we'll have to watch that. And the best I can say is that if anything does happen on it, we will let you know. And so just lastly, in conclusion, you know, a lot of the relief, obviously, for health and welfare plans is, is kind of no longer available or is going to be ending soon. You know, focus on documentation that you complied with a lot of these requirements. That's going to be the most important thing, I think, in the coming months. Um, and I think just what happens with the pandemic is going to determine kind of what happens from now on out and any, you know, necessary relief. And employers need to continue to work with their service providers just to ensure their compliance. And so I know we're about like 30 seconds over time. Um, Jill, any ending thought for you? Yes. Beth, is this webinar ongoing or is it over? This webinar is over. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully, maybe this is the last webinar about COVID that we have to do. Uh, um, yes. But who knows? I can't, I can't promise that. Um, Amber, I will kick it over to you to do your outro. Thank you, Beth and Jill, for sharing your valuable time and expertise with us today. To reiterate, today's presentation was recorded. We will be sharing the recordings in the follow-up email. If there are any portions of this call that you missed, by Friday you will receive an email with a link to the full recording. The PowerPoint slides used during this presentation will be shared in the same email. At the end of this call, a survey will populate in a new window. Please take a brief moment to complete the survey as it lets us know what topics are important to our listeners and helps make our education program as current and relevant as possible. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great day.